record high GDP growth of 14% in 2011. Couldn't be sustained and continue to decline to the present 3.7% in 2016. And if you notice, the South Car Service released um, almost final figures for 2016 on the 27th of September. And that meant we have to go back and do a little polishing up of our data in our report. Global GDP fell from 3.4% in 2015 to 3.1% in 2016. And advanced economies registered a decrease in growth from 2.1% in 2015 to 1.7% in 2016. And the reasons for the relatively low growth in emerging markets and development economies, including domestic policy weakness, tight domestic and external financial conditions, declining oil prices, as well as investments and supply constraints. Growth rates of emerging and developing Asia fell slightly from 6.7% in 2015 to 6.4% in 2016. The declining growth of the region is largely attributed to the low growth in China and India. However, the region continues to enjoy the highest growth rate in global, the global economy, followed by emerging markets and developing economies. <coughs> so, so this graph shows the world output, and you'll notice that from 2010 we've had a, a decline. Um, just that it's flattened a little between 2012 to 2014, but the trend shows a, a decline. This graph shows <coughs> the trend in world monthly crude oil prices, and you notice that um, in 2017 we've had oil prices moving a little higher than what we saw in 2016. And this is uh, attributing uh, one of the reasons for these low prices was the demand weaknesses, especially in emerging market economies, compounded by the low prices. But we expect to see oil prices not falling uh, uh, below the 2016 uh, prices. Now let's look at employment. We global economic recovery has largely failed to improve employment levels in the wake of financial and economic crisis. Unemployment rate worldwide was 5.7% in both 2015 and 2016. Global unemployment increased by 3.2 million above that of the previous year. And unemployment rates among the youth between 15 and 24 years remain on average twice as higher than among other cohorts of the labor force. And Ghana is also experiencing a similar trend. Youth unemployment is estimated at 13.1% compared to 12.9% prevailing in 2015, resulting in about 74.5 million young people unemployed globally. This graph shows the trend of unemployment rates uh, between 2009 and 2018. And you've noticed that uh, between 2017-2018, they started, um, uh, um, sorry, uh, 2017, uh, unemployment rates uh, went up, and we expect it to be almost the same level in 2018. Now let's look at Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa's GDP growth declined substantially from 3.4% in 2015 to 1.4% 1 in 2016, and the decline in growth is attributed to factors such as continuous decline in commodity prices, with oil prices being lower on average in 2016 than in 2015. The sub-Saharan African region's growth rate is projected to increase from 1.4% in 2016 to 2.6% 2 in 2017. This forecast is underpinned by factors such as the benefits arising from lower oil Prices. And I'm, I'm sure Nigeria will not be happy with such a statement. Um, an improved business environment and continuous strong infrastructure investment among non resource intensive countries. And this graph shows the trend in real GDP growth for Sub Saharan Africa. And you'll notice that from 2014, it's taking a, a, a dive down. Uh, and 
we experienced uh, a, a further decline between 2015 and 2016. We hope that 2017 will see a growth and not a decline. Now let's come to Ghana. I mean, knowing what is happening in the global uh, economy and in Africa, we try to situate what is happening in Ghana. Ghana's GDP grew by 3.7% in 2016, a decline from the 3.8% in 2015. That has continued a downward trend since 2011. Realized growth rates was below the revised target of 4.1. Since 2014, non-oil GDP growth has outpaced overall GDP growth, with the gap widening in 2016. Somebody will wonder whether having oil is, is good or not. But we will, we will appreciate it later when I show you the graph of our performance. The ranking of the sectorial growth in 2016 is similar to that in 2015 and 2014, with services leading the way, followed by agriculture and then industry. Real per capita GDP growth fell from 1.3% in 2015 to 1% in 2016, and uh, an end of year inflation of 15.4% compared to the target of 10.1. So this is a graph showing <coughs> the trend in real GDP, non-oil GDP, and per capita GDP. And you've noticed that between 2014 and 2015, the gap between uh, real GDP growth and real non-oil GDP growth has widened. Um, I know the South Car Service is currently rebuilding the economy, and I hope when that data is out, the various weights that we have for the various sectors will, will, will come out clearer. But it's worrying when you see the non oil uh, uh, part of the economy growing faster than with the oil. Now, let's look at the services sector. That's the largest and fastest growing economy in 2016. <clears throat> in 2016, real services sector growth fell short of the target 6%, a 0.3 percentage point difference, and formed 57% of GDP in 2016. Similar to 2015, seven out of the 10 subsectors exceeded their growth targets in 2016. Information and communications recorded the highest growth rate but the sector's contribution to the services sector's GDP remained consistently low, accounting for 5.8% in 2016. Industrial. There was a weak performance of the industrial sector in 2016, largely due to disruption in oil production and lower growth of the water and sewage subsector. However, it remains the second largest economic sector after the services sector, accounting for 24.3% of GDP in 2016. The performance of the individual industrial subsectors was generally positive, even though the overall growth of the sector was negative. There was a substantial growth in the electricity generation subsector of 11.7%, which led to the end of the electricity load shedding program. The construction subsector accounted for 43.2% of the output of the industrial sector, accounted for 13.7% of the nominal GDP. Let's look at agriculture, the backbone of the nation. Agricultural sector is still in recovery from the low growth rate recorded since 2011. After two successive years of growth deceleration, the sector expanded by 3.6% in 2016. Positive trend is observed for all the five subsectors, but the greatest recovery was made in the cocoa subsector. And you know, the interesting thing with data is when the economy in a particular year growth is very, very low, a little effort moves us into positive. But even though when you see positive, it doesn't mean that we are out of the problem. Okay. So when we are seeing growth, we should also try and look back at what was happening before. Contribution of the sector to national output was 18.9% in 2019. 
And I am sure once the rebasing is done, we might even see a lower percentage for agriculture. But that doesn't mean that production is going to go down. Okay. I mean, we need another discussion to, to, to understand this, this, this process. And one expects that the services sector, uh, in terms of contribution to GDP, is going to increase. Because there's a lot of, you see, we should also forget that even in agriculture, there's agricultural services, which you'll find in the services subsector. <clears throat> the production of food crops in the, is the single most important employer of rural labor force in Ghana. And we'll go into details when we look at the part that one of the optional chapters of the rural population engaged in food production and the implications for the wider economy in terms of food prices and real incomes. Here, yeah, the performance of the food crop sector is a key real sector indicator because that is where most of the rural population finds itself. Total cultivated area, here referring to food crops, decreased by approximately 3.9%. Aggregate mean yields increased by 10.4%. And this point crudely towards some kind of intensification. So what it's meaning is that our, our increase in the yield is not based on expansion in land size. I mean, this is, uh, uh, that's what we put it as uh, cruelly uh, uh, speaking, is towards a uh, kind of intensification. But we need to understand very well. Is it because of the galaxy? That's why farmers cannot expand. There are a lot of other issues that one has to look at. This graph shows the sectorial contribution to the national GDP. And you will notice that the services has been dominating since 2010. Um, with oil, commercial export of oil in 2011, agriculture was displaced by the industrial sector. And we've seen that trend with services every year increasing its contribution to the GDP. Fiscal development. The main policy objective for 2016 was <coughs> to strengthen the government's financial position and drive down the overall budget deficit from 6.3% of GDP in 2015 to 5.3% in 2016. The overall budget deficit, including diversity receipts, of about 15,608 million Ghana cities, representing 9.3% of GDP, up from the 7.3% of GDP in 2015. Government revenue as a percentage of GDP decreased by two percentage points, from 21.4% in 2015 to 19.4% in 2016. And the decline was mainly uh, um, driven largely by direct taxes. Tax revenue in nominal terms has seen a continuous increase over the past years. And that is why we always hear GRA exceeding their targets. Maybe they need to set more difficult targets so that uh, for once they can tell us that it was difficult. Because uh, they are always able to exceed their targets, but we don't have enough resources to meet domestic uh, payments. However, the tax revenue of 28,868 million Ghana cities was not achieved. And there was a shortfall of about 10.9% in 2016. Total government payments, including outstanding obligations for 2016, amounted to 51,884 million Ghana cities. As a share of GDP, total government payments for 2016 were 31% compared compared to the 2015 share of 29.4%. This following the election cycle trend of increased government spending relative to pre-election year. Total interest payments, which comprise payment on domestic and external debt, amounted to 10,770 million Ghana cities, which was 2.7% higher than budgeted. The high domestic interest payment compared to external interest payment is explained by increased domestic borrowing. Total capital expenditure in 2016 amounted to 7,678 million Ghana cities, which is 20.1% higher than the target of 6,393 million Ghana cities. 
the higher overturn was driven partly by higher foreign finance expenditure, which was on account of higher project loan disbursements than anticipated. Monetary and financial development. Broad, money, broad monetary policy goal was to achieve a single digit inflation target with a medium term anchored by a floating exchange rate regime. 2016 ended with some favorable outcomes, an end of year inflation rate of 15.4% compared to 17.1% recorded in 2015, with a decline driven mainly by non-food factors and the relative stability of the Ghanaian city. And here, an interesting scenario. In, in July, I went to the US and I decided to use my ATM card, which had my CD, on the ATM in the US. And when I was living in Ghana, the exchange rate was 4.23. When I took money using my ATM card, the exchange rate that, was, that the ATM used was 4.9. So I was asking myself, um, that stable exchange rate we are talking of in the country, does it cross our borders? I think we need to reflect on what we mean by stable exchange rates this are being moving out of the country. Broad money recorded an annual growth rate of 22% in 2016 compared to 7.3% in 2015. The, the tight term monetary policy stance of the central bank failed to curb the growth in money supply as broad money increased from 46.45 billion Ghana cities in 2015 to 56.69 billion Ghana cities in 2016. Net foreign assets rose by 34.04% due to a huge increase in foreign holdings of deposit money banks. Net domestic assets, with the central bank rose by 28.51% in 2016, as compared to 7.11% in 2015. The primary factor for the growth in NDA was an increase in the net claims of the government by some 47%. The year 2016 saw the central bank maintaining the policy rate at 26% in spite of heightened inflationary expectation due to the polls. Inflation fell from 17.2% in September to 15.4% by end 2016. Interest rate on 91-day treasury bills decreased to 22.87% by September 2016 from 23% by end year in 2015. Average lending rates rose from 28.2% to 32.68% by the end of second quarter of 2016, as non-performing loans reached 19.3% by end March 2016. And when you see size things, that's why right, Dr. Aka will say that in the Canadian economy is very, very interesting. It's very, very difficult to, 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 to see, to, to get a trend in some of uh, 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 the data and related to what is happening happening in real life. Let's look at the external sector. Ghana's trade pattern in 2016 reflected some slight improvement over previous years. The balance of payments recorded a surplus as a result of an improved current account balance, driven mainly by the rise in gold export receipts and reduction in non-oil imports. In 2016, the balance of payment surplus was 247 million US dollars which was 0.6% of GDP, from the 2015 deficit position of 106 million US dollars. The export share decreased by 2.4%, while the import share registered a decline of 6.7%. And this graph shows the trend in merchandise exports. And you notice that from 2014, um, Export to GDP and imports to GDP ratio has been declining. Okay. And I'm sure this is a response to, uh, of consumers. Um, Ghana's trade openness, which is measured by the sum of 
imports and exports divided by GDP, you notice that um, between 2014 and 2016 has been declining. And this is reflected in the decline in the size of um, the imports and exports. Um, with the exchange rate movements, you notice that between 2011 and 20, should I say 2015, there was a, there was a gradual increase. 2016, um, it's been flattened a little, and we expect that in 2017, we should see it more flatter, okay? Now let's look at the optional chapters, and here I'll look 